Thank you so much. Good evening, and thank you all for being here. My name is Sarah Kasprowitz, and I'm very excited to talk to you tonight about the Reluctant Rocket Man. Um, and this is my father, Ray Dousman. Are you going to stand or sit? You can sit. You will be telling some stories about growing up in Kankakee and about the book, and I will let you know. Um, so to give you a little background about the Blue Flame, the Blue Flame um, did hold the absolute world land speed record from 1970 to 1983, and it went 622.407 miles per hour, and it was the first car to ever reach 1,000 kilometers per hour, and the people in Europe love the Blue Flame because it was the first one to go 1,000 kilometers per hour. It's still the fastest American-built car, and my father designed the rocket engine to go 1,000 miles per hour. So why didn't it go 1,000 miles per hour? The story is in the book. So why write the book? This is the Blue Flame's current home, and it is um, displayed prominently at the Auto and Technique Museum in Zinsheim, Germany. And my husband and I were going on our honeymoon, and my dad found out we were going to Germany, and he said, you should go see the car. He hadn't really talked about it much at all when I was growing up, so I thought, well, if I'm in the neighborhood, I could do that. We went, my husband and I went to see the car, and the museum collectors were so impressed when they found out that the men who designed the car, um, including my father, were not even 30 years old. They were in their late 20s when they did this whole, this whole project. So that's when it hit me when I thought, I have to tell this story. And this is a picture from when I went to see it with my husband. Can you guys see okay? Okay. Um, so basically the research and writing part started off with my dad just telling his story into the tapes. And I would transcribe them handwritten and then also typing up what he said. So that's what you see on the left. On the right is just some of the drafts that we, that we did over the years. Good thing that my dad is a pack rat because he did keep everything. He, he kept things from high school, from elementary school, from... Um, the Army, he took his Rolodex when he left Re Reaction Dynamics, and so he has all of that stuff in boxes, and now they're at my house. So our talk begins in Kankakee. We're so excited to be here because one of the favorite times in my dad's life was when he lived in Kankakee, um, in particular the summer when, he's ten, when he was 10 years old. Um, so Ray did li live on the corner of Greenwood and Bourbonnais. He was a paper boy for the Kankakee Daily Ju Journal. He did attend St. Patrick's grade school, and he had a lot of adventures, uh, especially with his best friend down on the right, Art Yankee. So, Dad, did you want to talk a little bit about what it was like to grow up in Kankakee? Yes. <laughs> well, I lived in Kankakee. Can everybody hear me? Okay, I, I lived in Kankakee from... Um, I would say, let's see, um, I went to third, fourth, and fifth grade at St. Patrick's School, so I don't remember exact years, but uh, I'm guessing like in the 46, 7, 8, 9, something like that, or I think it was maybe 47, 48, 49, or 50, I guess would be more, more like it. And um, to put it bluntly, I had just a wonderful time. Uh, as a young kid in Kankakee, Illinois. And uh, why did that, why was it so happy? Well, um, we were not, my parents uh, were not rich by any means. My dad worked for the Public Service Company of Northern Illinois. And um, they shifted him around from various towns about every four years. So uh, one of those, uh, <coughs> one of those uh, sequences was Kankakee. And um, we lived on a, a small house, which is no longer there. I think it was torn down a couple years ago on the northwest corner of uh, Greenwood and Bur what we called Bourbon, Bourbonus in those days. Nobody said Bourbonnet. I don't know. What, do what do you still say here? Do you still, still say Bourbonus or Bourbonnet? Bourbonus? Do <laughs> Never occurred to us to say Bourbonnet. 
Yeah, nobody ever objected, so I guess most people uh, said that. Uh, yeah, well, we had, um, I would say in the four years that we lived there, I accumulated with, within the let, you know, a radius, of maybe two or three blocks, a group of uh, boys and girls uh, that were my very best friends. And uh, we spent most of our time just out there having fun. Of course, when we were not at school. In those days, school wasn't fun. I'm always amazed that today I talk to my grandchildren and they say, oh, how they look forward to going to school. I never look forward to going to school. I couldn't wait until summer vacation. And uh, most of my friends felt the same way. Uh, we had fun, uh, I should say the fun, we, I was going to say we had fun with the nuns, but I think it was the nuns that were having fun with us. <laughs> they taught at the grade school and the high school. My sisters went to the high school. Uh, I was an altar boy. Uh, I was in the uh, choir, the children's choir at St. Patrick's Church. And, um, so I, and I was also in the, the first band that the elementary school started when I was there. I think it was in third grade they started it. So I got my musical education there at an early age, playing the cornet in the grade school band. Um, that can, I, can I tell the story about the river? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, one of uh, my dad's favorite memories is um, with his best friend, Art. So I'm just going to read to you a little bit from this part, from the book from 1949. So, I knew what I was after, fish. Today was a great day to snag some smallmouth bass out of the Kankakee River. I pedaled through the side yard next to our house and turned right. I coasted halfway down Greenwood Avenue, happy for a breeze against my sweaty face. The river was four blocks straight ahead at Cobb Park, but I turned on River Street to see if Art was home yet. He had gone hunting with his father that morning. Art's family supplemented their diet with local wildlife cuisine from time to time. His father took him rabbit and squirrel hunting all over Kankakee County. For Art's 11th birthday, his dad gave him an over and under shotgun, and a 22 rifle. After that, Art counted on me to be his uh, squirrel hunting sidekick. We'd ride our bikes two miles north of town, and Art would quietly patrol the area for varmints. As a sidekick, I just followed along, trying not to scrape up my bare feet on the uneven rocks and scratchy weeds. I carried a small, a green canvas tote bag with a long shoulder strap. Whenever Art killed a rabbit or a squirrel, I would twist its head off and let it bleed out on the ground. And then, that sounds fun. <laughs> um, can you, Vicki, can you get the lights up here a little bit? Okay, thanks. I'm afraid I'm not on camera if I move down there. That was a lot of fun, by the way, twisting off the heads. <laughs> My mother wouldn't let me have a gun whatsoever, so I was uh, destined to be a sidekick. Okay, here we go. I'm going to keep going with art. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you said here that, you, that it was, I didn't like the killing, head twisting, or the mess. After a couple of times, I decided to retire and spend some time being thankful that my father wasn't a hunter. Art was singing something and carrying his fishing pole toward the garage. I pulled up to the curb and shouted, so, rabbit soup tonight? How about some squirrels? He looked at me and grinned. I realized he wasn't singing. He was chanting his favorite ditty. Art called out, Gene, Gene, made a machine. Frank, Frank, turned the crank. Joe, Joe, made it go. Art, Art, let a fart and blew the hang whole dang thing apart. I never figured out if this was a compliment. It looked like he was ready for the river, so I said, how about some fishing? It's a good day to mess around in the river. Art looked around, and when he didn't see any parents to object, he went over to the, his garage and wheeled out his bike. Yeah, got a couple of hours anyway, he said. Art lived in a prime location because his house was less than a block from the A&W root beer stand. We took a right on River Street and passed the Shell Station and several small businesses. It only took a few minutes to get to our fishing spot. We left our bikes on the sidewalk and prepared to climb down to the riverbank. 
The road was much higher than the river at this point, so we held our fishing poles in our mouths and used the wall of an old brewery building next to the river as our ladder. This old crumbling wall had large pieces of limestone jutting out from, of the ruins of a brewery that served as our rungs as we scrambled down to the river. And we just drove by that tonight, and now there is a ladder over there so the kids don't have to use the wall to um, climb down. I went first, and Art started singing his farting song again. Since his rear end was just a couple of feet above me, I hoped he wouldn't make good on his promise. As soon as my feet touched the stones below, I hopped away from the wall and started looking for bait. Massive glaciers really did a number on Kankakee County during the last ice age 10,000 years ago. The ice advanced and receded several times and ground up the landscape. The glaciers would pick up huge amounts of earth and reform the countryside by leaving gaping holes and spitting large piles of rocks and soil across the region. This glacial till of limestone, granite, and sandstone was scattered along the river and in surrounding fields. We found our bait under rocks along the shore. I started lifting medium-sized rocks to find some crayfish or hel helgramites. After four tries, I had success when I spotted a crayfish wedged between two rocks. I grabbed it and tossed it on the shore. Art's job was to find some good sticks for fishing pole props. Several overgrown bushes grew near the embankment, and he tore off a couple of branches and started walking toward me. After a couple more tries, I found a crayfish for Art, so we spent a few moments piercing the crayfish and making sure our bobbers were attached near the end of the line. We both had steel casting rods about three feet long. In order to make a good cast, you had to hold one thumb on the line, bring the rod back, and flick your wrist while letting go of the line. Since we had bobbers, we could set our poles on the riverbank and explore or wade in the water while we waited for a bite. Art cast first, and I followed soon after. One time he didn't wait for me to get out of the way, and his fishing hook landed in my hair and almost ripped my ear off. Ever since then, I let him go first and made sure I was out of the line of fire. All right. I'm going to go to when you decided to walk across the river. Children, do not try this. Okay, sorry to say yeah, that. We did it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody cared. So Art and I set, a, set off across the river side by side. The water was just a couple feet deep, so it came up to my waist at its deepest point. I wondered how long it would take us to make it to the opposite bank, which was approximately a football field's length away. The rocks were not sharp, so we didn't have to worry about cutting our feet. The edges had been polished by the constant pull of the water, and a coat of spongy algae turned the so stones into slippery marbles under our feet. My jeans immediately doubled in weight with rushing water. The current pressed against my left leg, so I put most of my weight on that side to make sure I didn't get swept away. I felt around with my right foot for a stable place to advance. My arms felt light and free as I waved them up and down and then back and forth to keep my footing. I heard a splash and looked to my right. Art was down. He was trying to stand up again while the current was sending him straight for the bridge. I could see his arms slapping at the water, trying to push himself out of the water and back on his feet. Ah, rats, right! Holy crap, what the... He sputtered between bobs. He looked at the bridge and tried to turn back to get back to shore before he was pulled up against the cement bridge support. We tried to keep away from the bridge supports because the water tended to churn like a washing machine around the base of each support. One time, Art had banged up against the center support six or seven times before he was able to push himself away from it and coast downstream. Art, just pick up your knees and ride it. You're in the middle of the supports. You're clear, you're clear, I shouted. He ignored me and went down face first. He managed to get a hand on the riverbed and steady himself enough to squat. He slowly stood up and kept his hands straight out in front of him. His head was bent forward and he was facing the bridge. I could see rivulets of water stream down his back. After a couple seconds, he started to shuffle to his right, carefully stepping on the bank where we started. I looked across the river and figured, well, since I was almost halfway across, I should keep going. It took me almost half an hour to pick my way across the river and back, but I was glad I took the time to see if I could do it. Art was sitting on the rocky shore with his fishing pole in his hand, yawning. Ray, it's almost five o'clock, so I'll see you later, he said. Me too. Hey, that was fun. Next time we can switch places and I'll grab you if you start to swim by, I assured him. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Or I'll push you under if you get in my way, he grinned. Art and I walked across the river several times that summer. Each time we tried to do it faster than before. Adults passing by never gave us any trouble or called the police when they would see us pulling the stunt. No one seemed concerned in the least. If a boy tried to cross that same river today, I think five or six witnesses would call 911 before the boy got his knees wet. Okay, so early rockets. 
Do you want to talk a little bit about the early rockets that you would mess around with and design? Yeah, I'd be glad to do that. Um, when I was in, it sort of started in, well, I should say that while we lived here in Kankakee, uh, right after the war, Second World War, there was a great uh, abundance of uh, military M80 firecrackers that were available pretty cheap. So uh, I got an interest in explosives, <laughs> uh, in a way, by uh, always having a pocket full of these things. Uh, to do with whatever I felt like doing, and as did some of my friends. So uh, we spent a lot of times blowing things up. Um, it was great fun uh, until I the sort of the, when I got a the last time I blew anything up, uh, I was at the park down by the river. I don't know what was the was it did it used to be called Cobb Park? Park I don't remember that. I think we always call it Riverside Park or something like that. But anyway, they they had a um, uh, out or no, they had a um, bathroom building there on the corner of the park, and um, I remember they had uh, one uh, toilet in there for the on the girls' side and one on the boys' side. And Art and I were standing there one day <clears throat> looking for something to blow up. And uh, I looked in there, I saw that porcelain toilet bowl there with water in it. And I said, you know, you know, these things, the, the fuses on these M80s were waterproof, you know, so you could throw them in the water and they'd still fire. So I said, let's, let's see what happens when we throw one of those M80s in the toilet. So he says, well, I, I don't want to do that, you do it. So I said, okay. So I, I lit one off and threw it in the toilet and sort of stood back. <laughs> and I thought it, all it was going to do was just blow the water out of the toilet. <laughs> but to, uh, I never really knew before that toilet bowls aren't made out of metal, they're made out of ceramic material. <laughs> so anyway, the thing went off and the toilet uh, turned into a big pile of chunks of ceramic. <laughs> so did you run away? And looking around. Nobody. <laughs> There was nobody there, and so, so he said, you know, we, well, why don't we get out of here and <laughs> go Good somewhere Good idea. Else. So, but, I mean, that was surprising. I mean, I didn't really intend to blow up the toilet, but that's what happened. I hope there's no public uh, park people the here. The Statue of Limitations this. is probably up <laughs> for the blowing up toilets. So these are some examples of the early rockets that my dad experimented with yeah. and designed and when he was a boy and in high school and in, in college. Um, and then, after college, he was working at um, the Illinois Institute of Technology Research Institute, um, and he made a friend named Dick Keller. And Dick uh, invited him to go to a drag race up to Great Lakes Dragway in Wisconsin. And this um, illustration is from the comic book, from the Blue Flame comic book, and so it's a little picture of them. And so um, the idea was started when my dad went to see these drag races. And what did you tell Dick? Well, um, well yeah, we work just down the hall from each other. He, I was in the chemistry research. Uh, we were both working in chemistry research building. Um, I was working on one project for fuel cells, and he was working on something, something else. And um, but we got to know each other re real well. We we lived in the same uh, uh, apartment uh, building that was set aside for staff. And we were both married, had children. So anyway, uh, one day uh, he says, you know, uh, there's going to be a big drag race up at uh, Union Grove, Wisconsin uh, this uh, Saturday evening. Uh, why don't you come along with me? I, I said, nah, I don't think so. He says, well, you know, you might, might find it interesting. They have jet-powered cars there sometimes. And, and at this particular uh, race, or this particular event, they're going to have several. And you might find that interesting. And I told him, well, I'm not really at all interested in racing. I've never been interested in racing. I could care less about drag racing. But then I got thinking, well, he, we, he did live down the hall from us, and, and, and we babysitted each other's children. And I said, oh, heck with it. I'll go down there just, I just, want, <laughs> just to be friendly. So we went, <clears throat> and we spent the whole evening up there. Well, I remember there was a lot of noise. 
as one of the gentlemen here in the audience that had a drag race uh, in that general time period up there. And um, it was uh, it was interesting from a technical point, point of view. Uh, there was a lot of bang and, and crashes and loud noises. I, that was sort of nice. But um, <laughs> uh, other than that, I didn't really, I never did get interested in racing. I still am not interested in racing, car racing. But anyway, I went up there, so we, I saw that, and we're driving back. Uh, we, we, lived in, we lived in Chicago, so we're driving back to Chicago after this event, and I, nobody's saying anything, and I, I just thought, I told him, I said, you know, I'm not interested in, in drag racing, but if I were, I would not go with the uh, piston engine cars. I mean, I because mean, all the people, I noticed that all the people at the drag race, they spent all their time messing around with the car while they were waiting to run. I mean, it was just, it's like they, they never, you know, they were taking parts off, putting parts on, turning it on, turning it off, you know, and then they had problems with the tires, you know, they're checking the tire. I said, why would you want to do that if you want, all you want to do is go fast on the, on uh, the quarter mile, why don't you just use a rocket engine? And he said, well, what do you know about rockets? I said, well, you know, I, I know a little bit. And, well, uh, and why don't I, why, while I play this video, why don't you explain, this is actually the prototype to the prototype of the Blue Flame. This is 25-pound um, thrust. There's no sound because it's um, an 8-millimeter video. Yeah, well, I told him, uh, if, I would, if I were going to do it, I'd use a rocket-powered car, and I'd use a hydrogen peroxide rocket as the rocket engine. He said, oh, yeah, well, how does that work? So I told him. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, that's interesting, you know. So anyway, about two weeks later, uh, he came up to me again and says, well, why, why don't you uh, draw up a little sketch or something over the rocket engine and, and so I'll know what, what it is. Well, here, we finally, I finally did that, and we got some hydrogen peroxide. And here I, we're running a, a test on an engine I designed that just put out 25 pounds of thrust, decomposing hydrogen peroxide. And... Um, that's me up on top there, <laughs> and we're filming it with eight millimeter camera, and that so that was the first time I, I actually built a hydrogen peroxide rocket and actually fired one to show Dick that what it, how it would work, you know. So so then the prototype to the the one after that actually was the rocket that you designed for the X1, the first world record breaking car that you were involved with. And that, that rocket had a 2,500-pound thrust. Yeah, I went from that little tiny thing. We decided, well, we need more horsepower and 25 pounds. So, so I said, well, go, I'm going to scale it up to 2,500 pounds. And so we did that and uh, built the engine. We got a, a friend of ours, and uh, uh, Pete Barnesworth, to, to build the car itself. Uh, so we, this, is a, this is the first time this car, the dragster, ran at a drag strip. It doesn't have an aerodynamic shell on it, but it's just the body. So I'm, I'm going to show, I'm gonna show the, um, the run of the X1 where it, do, it does have the body. Yeah. We were the first, this was the first car to ever go over 200 miles an hour and a quarter mile. Uh, yeah, we got sort of elaborate after that. <laughs> we got our own truck and... Uh, we, we take, took money from the food, food budget and the, the rent, rent money to buy the hydrogen peroxide. It was pretty expensive. So that's we, Chuck Zuba. We got Zuba. a lot of trouble for that. But anyway, this, this is the um, car itself, and this is a, the dr driver, Chuck, Chuck Zuba, who uh, decided to drive it for us. I was, they asked me if I wanted to drive it, and I said no. Too so, dangerous. There, there you go. Uh, that run, uh, that run was, was it the record run. No, that was not. That was oh. before. The record oh, okay. run was at US 30 drag strip. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was uh, over 200 miles an hour. I think it was like six seconds or something. Elapsed time. So there's a picture of um, the X1 then and now. Actually, um, Pete Farnsworth, um, also of Reaction Dynamics, the person that was in charge of um, supervising the body assembly of the Blue Flame is Pete Farnsworth. And he 
is on the right here, and they have restored the X1, and they showed it at the 45th anniversary this um, past October. So that's pretty exciting. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the collaboration with Illinois Institute of right. Technology? Okay, so at any rate, um, after we ran the, the car, it's about 1968, we started running it in 66, the dragster, and in 68, uh, Dick Keller, uh, he, he was then working for the Institute of Gas Technology right across the street from where we used to work. Uh, I was still at the IIT Research Institute. But uh, he, he talked, the, um, the Institute of Gas Technology was the research arm of the um, American Gas Association, which is a conglomerate of companies that uh, is in business to uh, sell natural gas. and. Uh, equipment and so forth that goes along with it. So um, at that time, uh, AGA was trying to interest um, the government in uh, converting the domestic airline fleet from burning kerosene to liquefied natural gas in their jet engines, and um, among another, uh, a number of other things. Uh, they wanted to just get out of the gas, you know, selling gas to homeowners and so forth in industry. So um, they took an interest in this as, a, as just sort of a, a PR thing where they could, um, we would, they would give us the money to build the blue flame, uh, which, would, which were, would use the hydrogen peroxide plus liquefied natural gas, which was their product, which, and that was what they were trying to promote as an energy source for high-performance vehicles. So um, they finally decided to do that and in 1968. Uh, the three of us, uh, Pete and Dick and I, resigned our jobs as uh, lab techs. Pete was a truck mechanic in Milwaukee, and uh, so we got money to, to build the Blue Flame. And it took two years. Uh, it took me a little over a year to design and build the rocket engine, and uh, it took a little over two years to get the car and the rocket engine together and out to the salt flats to try and set a world speed life record. So here are some of the things that were generated. This is just a, a simple schematic of the, of the way the Blue Flame engine worked. Uh, <clears throat> they had a tank of hydrogen peroxide here that you'd run into the combustion chamber and it would decompose catalytically into oxygen and steam. And you had LNG that would come into a heat exchanger. It would uh, preheat a small amount of LNG to start a a flame with a gaseous oxygen in the in the combustion chamber. Uh, as soon as that happened, then uh, most of the liquid LNG would go in and be discharged through some spray valves to uh, produce most of the extra thrust. And that engine, uh, working properly, would put out 22,000 pounds of thrust, uh, and it, it was uh, throttleable. Uh, there was no throttleable. Uh, liquid propellant rocket engines on the market at that time. Um, so, so the, that the driver was, could control the speed. The driver could make it Yeah, go in other words, uh, the most rocket, liquid propellant rocket engines at that time, you, you lit them off and that was it. Uh, you just hung on for the ride. You could shut them off, but you couldn't throttle them. So um, this one could be throttled for the safety of the driver if he wanted to decelerate or he wanted to stop. He had control over the... Uh, the thrust output of the rocket engine at all times. And you may have heard of the driver, Gary Gablet, And so um, he was quite a character. And um, you became pretty good friends with him at the time. Yeah, Gary, Gary came. Um, we had um, originally signed up, or the, I shouldn't say we, the, the sponsor had signed up a guy named Don Garlitz, who was a hotshot drag racing uh, character at that time. The you and the drag racing <laughs> Yeah, he was, he was signed up to be the driver of the Blue Flame. Uh, after, post, post that, uh, Gary Gablitz showed up at our, uh, our shop one day, and I was there by myself, and he introduced himself, and he says, you know, I'd like to drive the car. I said, well, you know, we already got somebody. But anyway, he showed me the, all his background, what he had done, and so forth. He, was, uh, he worked with, um, I think it was maybe North American, as a test astronaut. 
uh, in like in centrifugal and centrifuge systems where they were testing g-forces to see how much g-forces a person could take uh, were they an astronaut uh, and he was they would use him as a they were using him as a not as an astronaut but as someone that would be testing uh, body stresses and things uh, that an astronaut would uh, experience so anyway, he told me about that situation, that he was doing that and everything. And he, he raced drag racers, and he raced drag boats. And he was quite an accomplished driver. And I said, well, I don't know. If it doesn't work out, you know, maybe, maybe you can drive. But right now, uh, we've got somebody. So anyway, uh, he kept on. He showed up a number of other times and just sort of kept on about it. Uh, but it, as it turned out, um, when the sponsor organization was going to have a big uh, public press conference out in L.A. to announce who was going to drive the car, um, they found out, I mean, this was a big deal. They had all the TV stations, they had all the newspapers, magazines, everybody was out there. We were out there explaining how the rocket engine worked and so forth. But then the next day, uh, they were going to bring in the driver so the press could uh, interview the driver, which would be Don Garlitz. Well, the day before that, w that interview was going to take place, Don called up and said he couldn't do it. So <laughs> the uh, sponsor organization went apoplectic because now they didn't have anybody to announce as the driver. And so I said, well, call Gary Gablich. He, he, he lives in Long Beach, which is just down the road from here. And I think he'd, he'd be very happy to drive. So that that's what they lucky did. Day. That's what they did. And uh, he showed up the next day, and he, he was the driver. He was the driver. Um, and when I started talking to my dad about writing this book and really getting into the story, um, I found out one of the reasons it really needs to be told is to what happened with the rocket engine that my father designed. Um, he worked very closely with Jim McCormick, who was also, a, uh, he was a pioneer in the hydrogen peroxide world and really an accomplished um, engineer. And they designed, he consulted with my dad, who designed this engine to go, it could have gone 1,000 miles an hour. That was in the plan. It didn't. So why not? Why, why didn't it go 1,000 miles an hour? So I'm just going to read to the part where, um, from the book about um, my dad telling where he was going to get the rocket tested, that it was not, the rocket was not going to be tested. By the way, I had the rocket engine sitting on the shaft floor like um, over a year before they took it out to the salt. So. My, my responsibility was to build and test the rocket engine. And um, so I had, at this time she's going to talk about, I had already done my part of the project, but I was still an officer in the company, so I was still involved in the project. Hello, Al. I began. This is Ray from Reaction Dynamics in Milwaukee. How are you? Ray, good to hear from you. We're all set for the 27th. When will you arrive? I can meet you at the airport. He sounded enthusiastic, and I was anything but... The thing is, Al, I don't think it'll work out, I told him. What do you mean? He answered. IGT has taken over the project, and I'm out of the picture as of January 1st, I said. The guys, are, um, taking, the guys taking over probably won't test it. So are they going to wait till next year to test it? I can see what we have available after the first of the year. I've got a conference in the last part of January, but February is wide open. We could set something up. He was trying to be accommodating, but I couldn't offer him any words of encouragement. I was pretty sure the testing wasn't going to happen. Well, you see, I doubt they will follow up with any testing at all. They, they might just take the rocket to the salt flats as is, I told him. They might, they might just not want to spare the time and money. I don't understand, he said. The rocket? I, I've never heard of this. Don't they know it could be dangerous? Are you, are you sure? No, I guess I'm not real sure about anything right now. I told IGT about the test date next week, but I didn't get the impression they thought it was all that important, I said. Dean D Dietrich is a new project manager, so I guess all decisions will go through him now. Why aren't you finishing the project, he, he asked. I'd like to, Al, but IGT took over the project, and since I didn't agree to the new arrangement, I'm out, 
I said. I'll leave the testing information with Pete and Dick. I wasn't sure if they were going to call you, so I thought I'd let you know what was going on. As I talked to Al, I was seeing in my mind what I was going to miss because of IGT, the IGT intervention. I felt a huge surge of emotion and regret that it was never going to happen for me. I had invested so much of my passion and energy to build this rocket motor, the first of its kind. I would never see it in action. Right, they can't take that rocket to the salt flats without testing it. Well, um, what happened was that um, since the, ro the rocket engine had been built on schedule, or actually I got it done before the schedule, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the body of the car, uh, you know, the fuselage and everything, wasn't anywhere near finished. And um, I didn't really have a part in that. We separated us, ourselves into compartments. I was the rocket engine guy. Pete was the, the body guy. He was going to build the car, and Dick was sort of the promoter guy. So uh, what happened was Pete fell way behind time-wise on getting the car, the car itself built. So the uh, sponsor got um, antsy about um, whether or not the thing was ever going to happen. So they came in one day and said, uh, because you're so far behind on the project, we are taking over the project, and you'll, you'll come to work for us. Not, you know. And uh, the, um, the other thing that happened was when they take they were when they were to take over they would then own the car. Uh, prior to that, we would own the car and we would just allow them to take it. And once the record was set, they could take the car around the world and, and exhibit it and get their public relations and their publicity from it. But then they'd have to give it back to us because it would be our car. And of course, it was my rocket engine. And uh, they decided that they weren't going to test the rocket engine. I had it all set up at a, at a professional t uh, lab out in Malta Test Station, out in New York State, and um, uh, Werner von Braun personally had arranged for that uh, at my request, and uh, I had been out there and, and saw the place, and, and uh, we made plans to test it, and we had plans on paper to test it and how it was going to be tested, but then the sponsor came in, took the project away from us. Uh, they weren't interested in testing it. They, they wanted to get the, uh, the car running as soon as possible, and so they were falling behind on their publicity uh, part of it. So that's when I left the project. So that's why I wasn't out there at the time they ran the car. And um, there was some other problem. Since I left before they could uh, install a rocket engine in the car, they didn't know how to install a rocket engine properly, and in the process of doing that, they left out a few components that were fairly vital to the proper function of the engine. And uh, the first time they tried to test, they took it out. Their, their test program was to take it to Union Grove, Wisconsin, at the drag strip, tie it down to a big post, and fire it off. And uh, that's what they did. And, and uh, when they did that, because they left out some parts, uh, they blew a big hole in the heat exchanger for the liquefied natural gas, which was uh, the second stage of the three-stage ignition system that had to be done. And once that ha okay. Oh, okay. So in this video, you'll see a van that was not in any of the um, promotional videos because I don't think that they wanted it really advertised that the blue flame needed a push start. Okay, this this is uh, at, at the last minute, uh, at the last uh, possible running at the salt flat. The car is being pushed by a high-powered truck down the strip. They weren't able to set a record because they were a little bit short on fuel. The crack side, and um, so now that in order to try and get the record, they're going to push it up to about 75 mile an hour, and then turn on the rocket engine so that. Uh, they could save uh, a little bit of fuel, and that's what's going on now. So you can hear Gary talking to um, the driver of the van, yeah, the talking driver, back and forth on the radio. Yeah, Gary Gabriel is speaking to the driver of the van, or the truck, and they're, they're waiting. As soon as they get to the proper spot, the truck's going to back off, and then he's going to make the engine. 
not going in. Are the rockets? They're still pushing it. He's push starting it. You'll see it. You'll see it when it starts. Yeah, they had to run it, I think. It, you know. I didn't know for sure that would do it, but this is what they're doing. This is on the last day that the pastor would make lands out there. You see the marker coming up? So then the van has to pull off to the side when they turn the rocket on. So that the van they're, doesn't they're blow going up. about 75 miles an hour right now. This, 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 vehicle, this car weighs about 6,000 pounds right now. With, with the, the fuel. You can see the lines on either side for the, the designated strip there. Okay, now they're, that's the There's truck. There's the van. And then when the van pulls over to the side, then, then they can start the rocket. doing this. And then the, it snowed later that day, which closed the salt for the entire season. So the day that they broke the record was the last day for the year. They would have had to come back the next year. Okay, so the interesting thing about this whole thing is um, they never really used any LNG. <laughs> so the rocket only had half the thrust. That It only had 11,000 pounds instead of 22,000 pounds. So that's why I didn't go a thousand miles an hour. You can tell by the rate at which it's accelerating that it wasn't going to take much longer to get to a thousand miles an hour. <laughs> but they ran out of, <laughs> there wasn't enough fuel. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so. Well, if they had 15,000 pounds of thrust, they would have had plenty of fuel. But yes. see, they, they blew out that heat exchanger in, in Wisconsin. They, they just went out there with what they could do, and, and that's all the faster they could go with half the thrust. See, that so that, and there were some conflicting goals because you, you wanted to have your own uh, you know, rocket business and design rockets for the, for the future and to um, stay in business doing that. And they were very, very vested in the world record and, and achieving the world record with the car, and that's really what they wanted to do. So the memoir is... It's I'm so glad that we told the story, and it did come full circle when we were at the, the 40th anniversary, and that was the first time that my dad heard his rocket being fired because he heard the recording of Gary, you know, breaking the record through the, through the radio. And so, you know, when you are an inventor, when you design something, when you are really driven by creativity and innovation, what is the price of that? What... It, it never can be exactly perfect. And so this was not p near perfect at all in my dad's eyes. So as far as how does that fit in with his, his life and his goals and the kind of man he is, it's a great accomplishment. And we are all so very proud of him. Um, but it was not an easy story for you to tell. And in the last couple of years, it's been nice because He's, at, he's been getting more involved with the current people who are trying to, set, trying to go 1,000 miles an hour. And so one of the teams is in Britain right now. They have the land speed record. Richard Noble is the one who um, beat the Blue Flame with his car. He still holds the record with his team. And they have a huge project in Britain called the Bloodhound Supersonic Car. And so my parents, hi, Mom, were going to England um, a couple of years ago 
And my dad got in touch with Richard Noble, who was very interested in having my dad, you know, the Blue Flame rocket engine designer, come to their project because they're also using rocket power. They're using a hybrid and kind of a mix in their car. And so um, they were very thrilled to have you come and share your expertise with the Blue Flame. And um, I think that that was great, too. One of the problems that I also I had with uh, leaving the project was that I had gone into it to start a business with my two friends, and I wasn't interested in racing as such, and that's what that was the problem is that instead of you know fighting the takeover, they just said, okay, you know, let's go do the race, and I said, well, if we do that, we're not going to have a company afterwards. So, and that's how it turned out. So. That was another problem with the situation I was facing. Mm -hmm. And I think part of why we didn't hear about it much when I was growing up, it was a difficult topic for you, for you to talk about. So um, he, he, this is from um, October of this year. They had a very nice 45th anniversary get together with um, Pete and Leah Far Farnsworth ran it with their family. And the upper right picture, those are some of the engineers from IIT who worked on the Blue Flame, and their graduate master's or doctoral thesis were, you know, part designing parts of the Blue Flame. And so a couple of the engineers came back for the celebration, so that was really great, too. By the way, these, these gentlemen were all from India. And to a, to a last, to the last, <laughs> there was five of them, and neither one of them, none of them knew which end of a screwdriver was their business then. <laughs> I mean, they were strictly academic. Well, I mean, and I, th I, I mean, it was just sort of strange, you know, that, that some guys like this got involved with this project, and by the time it was over, they were very good engineers, you know. But mm -hmm. uh, they couldn't came fix from anything. a background where, where they, they, um, they just weren't knowledgeable, you know, about actual... Well, things together. And I thought you were insulting them when we were at the 45th. He's telling a story saying, you know, I just thought you were real smart guys, but I uh, thought you had no idea which end of a screwdriver to use. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And then his wife looks up and, he, and she says, he still doesn't. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh. Uh -huh. Yeah, that whole thing with the, with the university, uh, you know, Illinois Institute of Technology is very, very... Very fortuitous. I mean, we were Dick and I were working there. We so you know it was everything sort of came together in a in a moment uh, that it worked out. Unfortunately, it didn't do do as well as we had hoped, but sometimes that's how it happens. And uh, it was a very interesting experiment. We do have a little bit of time left over. And by the way, we know the root beer stand is still open because we stopped there on our way here. So that was um, that was fun. Uh, do you have any questions for, for Ray about the Blue Flame or gr growing up in Kankakee or for, or for me? Well, uh, when the Reaction Dynamics um, Corporation didn't pan out, um, <clears throat> I went back, I went back to my old job as a well, I went back to my old profession as a lab tech, and um, I worked at that for about um, about eight years, and then I formed my own company to do um, testing at sewage treatment plants, um, doing certain types of specified tests to uh, make sure aeration systems in sewage treatment plants were, were uh, performing adequately. So I spent most of my career doing that. Uh, I also started, a, uh, as part of this same company, I, I, uh, Phyllis and I uh, man manufactured a, a um, flotation machine for archaeologists, which we, we're still in business doing that. Our, uh, archaeologists use this machine for uh, finding uh, macro-sized and micro-sized artifacts in soil. So uh, we're still in that business. We're about ready to retire from that too, I guess. So I finally did get into business, but I, this time I went in by myself. <laughs> I learned my lesson <laughs> the first go around. 
And uh, so I, I've been very successful in that. So, but I'm now retired from my day job, so to speak. Oh, you yeah. did? Really? Yeah. Mm. Oh, well, thank good. you for telling us that. That's good to hear. Very interesting that, that, that you went to IIT. Well, we lived in the dorms there on those four high-rise buildings they had there for the staff. Yeah, at Itri. Yeah, Itri lived there. <laughs> yeah, I was I was making three hundred and fifty dollars a month over there as a technician at that time. So, <laughs> and we, from that we had to take money for hydrogen peroxide. <laughs> the wires are not real heavy. <laughs> so, anyway, <clears throat> yes, sir. That's a good question. I'm surprised nobody asked that. Uh, it's called the Blue Flame because the logo of the American Gas Association is a blue flame. So they were the sponsor, they were paying for the project, so they put a great big blue flame right on the tail. So. The next project is going to be called the Blackbird, so I don't know what we're going to put on there. <laughs> So you retired from your other businesses, but if people come ask you for consulting for current world land speed record cars, mm. they know who to talk to. So that's still, pretty exciting. I'm still not a racer, though. <laughs> still not a racer. I think we had a question over here. Well, it was about 4,000 pounds of a car and 2,000 pounds of fuel. Yeah, that's correct. So it accelerated quite rapidly. Uh, just so you know, the, the entire, uh, the, the, the engine was designed to run for a total of 20 seconds to get to 1,000 miles an hour. So you can imagine the acceleration that uh, the driver was going to be feeling. <laughs> <laughs> He had guts. The new car that we're thinking about building is going to get to 1,000 miles an hour in 18 seconds. So it's, uh, I think it's like 767 or something like that. So, but now the Bloodhound project is going to try and go about 900 miles an hour. And they're using a, a turbojet engine in conjunction with a uh, hydrogen peroxide hybrid plastic rocket engine. And I wish them luck. <laughs> what is the view? The G, the G force. Oh, the G, G forces. It wasn't really that bad. I think it was like two or three Gs, somewhere in there. Well, that's, I, that means you're, you, at, at three Gs, your body weighs three times as much as it does normally. So if you're standing up, <laughs> it's difficult to stand up if you now weigh 600 pounds instead of 200 pounds. <laughs> but if you're sitting down in the proper position and everything, uh, it's not that bad as, as far as your body goes. If you get much over three Gs, I think you need a G suit. I think jet pilots usually wear a G suit about three Gs or, or and higher. So, and the IIT engineers really were careful to engineer the car so that it did not take off into the air. Right. It was wind tunnel. A, a model, a small model of it, was wind tunneled, uh, tested for stability up to a thousand miles an hour. So there was never any problem with the stability in the blue flame, at least at the speeds we, they went. Well, the, I think the, the, the scuttlebutt was he had finally told his wife about this. <laughs> no, seriously. I think 
I, I think they must have had some kind of agreement at some point prior to this that he wasn't going to, he was sort of retired at the time from drag racing anyway, but um, that's the story I heard was that when he told his wife <laughs> why he was going to L.A., she <laughs> told him not to go or something. <laughs> Pardon? Oh, you did. Did he say anything about that? <laughs> no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was really top top notch guy on that field. Mm -hmm. Oh. Well, that that's another good question. Well, I sort of touched on that one. I just told him I didn't want to go to the driveway. <laughs> and then I when he asked me to later when he asked me to uh sketch up a a, a peroxide rocket I told him, well, you know, what, I, I wasn't, wasn't real interested in doing that. I mean, I, all the way along the line, I, uh, I, was, I was a rocket man, but a reluctant racer, I guess mm -hmm. you could say it. I think the reluctant part is I didn't, I didn't like standing around the drag strip all day, you know, and I didn't, like the, I didn't like the social aspect of that, I mean, what was going on out there and everything. Well, we had several titles that we went through, and... Uh, we could not agree on them. He would have one that he really liked, and I'd say, no, just it, it needs to have rocket in it. Some like when people search for your book, it has to show up. It has to have some sort of connection with what it's about. And so then I would have one I would think was really super clever, and then he was. Ugh. So our friend Landspeed Louise Noeth actually came up with that, um, with the title and subtitle. And so I thought that is it. That's perfect because mm -hmm. the whole reluctant. Part of the, the racer. Yeah, well, L Land Speed Louise is a lady who's been in racing. Uh, she's been, she's, her whole life has been all about land speed record racing. And um, she's very knowledgeable and very respected in the field, and she writes a lot about the subject. And mm -hmm. she's, um, when she heard about our project, uh, or I should say, when she heard about uh, Sarah, uh, going to write the book, uh, she offered to help, and I think to some degree she helps her with yeah, some she's, things she's about She's been a mentor it. for me, which, is, which has been nice. Um, and she's working with Pete Farnsworth right now about um, h having him put forth a book. His story needs to be told, too. I mean, when you, I mean, I love listening to your stories, and you know so much. And you, when you sit down and listen to Pete Farnsworth talk about it, it's just, he, his story needs to be told, too. Um, a while ago, Dick Keller said he was writing a book. We haven't seen anything come out. He did produce a um, lengthy YouTube video with some with a, his narration, which was his, which was his story. Um, so we're not sure if he's doing a book as well. Um, there was talk with all three of the partners doing a book with Landspeed Louise, but that did not work out real well. Reminiscent of the three when you had a, your other business. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think that um, looks like we are out of time. We're, so we're happy to um, talk to you at the back. We do have some books here to sell, and we'll just sign them for free if you want, or if you brought one that you have, we'll sign that. Um, so thank you so much for your time and your attention tonight. It's been a thrill for me to be back in Kankakee with my dad. Um, the first time you brought me here, actually, you snuck me away from Grandma and Grandpa's, and you took me to Kankakee, and you took me to the candy store. I know. I know. So the sweet tooth mm -hmm. runs deep. So I, and I remember being impressed with it then, and when I came back to do research, came back and used this library for research to find out what was Kankakee like in 1949, because I didn't know. I'm a teacher, so I know what, how 10-year-old boys talk. So the conversations in the book and the scenes and the going back and forth between the friends, I can do because I know that. Writers write what they know, right? Um, but I needed to come to Kankakee and walk the streets and see the alleys and do the research here, and so that was really special for me, and so we're just glad to be back here tonight, and I'm happy my dad got to show my niece and my son uh, Kankakee, take him for the root beer float, and show him the river where, the, where he walked across and had all of his adventures. So thank you so much. Yeah, I would, I, I would like to thank the Kankakee uh, Public Library for their offer, offering uh, the room to us and for inviting us to come here. It's been very nice of you. I appreciate it.